student support update, address uh, validations, um, validating uh, turning fatals, Utah fits all the LEA um, staff email submission, the early warning system plan for school year 2025 and moving forward, and finally the 2025 LEA data meeting uh, proposed schedule. So again, welcome everyone for being here. Um, and with that, I'll turn the time over to Cliff. All right, thank you. So uh, I'll be going over the 2025, uh, 2024 sort of uh, steps we just went through, but doing it through the context of what we're gonna be doing for this next school year. Uh, go ahead and go for the next slide. So for the end of the prior school year, uh, what we're kind of just barely going through and soon to go through again and a heads up for next uh, end of school year, we have finalizing the Utrex data. And during that, we typically have a two week window uh, sometimes uh, that's opened up earlier when available. Uh, if we can give like a three week window for the end of year, uh, we do try to still do that, uh, but we do guarantee at least that two week window. Uh, the data corrections uh, all have to be put into place to where Utrex has that correct information and it's able to use that for finalizing it. And that also goes along with your historic updates. Uh, anything which needed to get corrected, this is kind of that last chance to get things into the system to where we have that correct snapshot data. Uh, and that is what happens with this finalization is that we get that final snapshot of where everything's at, what's accurate for you, all your issues resolved. And we use that to be able to help get the funding and just as a historical reference. Um, and that's moved over into our warehouse uh, after the entire process is through. So the key thing that you have to make sure is done during that time is resolving fatal errors. Yeah. Uh, anything which is just a warning, uh, we don't require that during the finalization period. That's something which is helpful for you, helpful for the students, um, as it does uh, make a difference in the data and how it's represented. Uh, but it's not such a difference that we're um, having to have a hard stance on it. Uh, we can't load that student's information without this being correct. And that's what happens with uh, what we call fatals or non-loading errors, is that the student's data at least for that object uh, out of the list of what we collect uh, will not get loaded until it's corrected. Uh, go ahead to the next screen. So in between school years, uh, we have a bunch of internal USBE steps. And I know I've gotten some questions from uh, LEAs about you know, what happens during this time frame. Is it possible for us to speed things up and we do always look for that opportunity. Uh, and hopefully this will add a little bit of clarity uh, as far as kind of the amount of things that we're working on during that period, uh, which is in July. So uh, after the finalizer window is closed, uh, the Utrex, the data warehouse, and SSID uh, at that point in time are unavailable uh, for six to 10 days, depending on the work required. Um, and that's because we have to, again, have all that down to be able to orchestrate getting that finalized data uh, audited and then out into place uh, for the application references. Then we've got the, during that time, the collections stop. So you don't send any collections during that time in between the school year. So once you finalized, um, if you're not familiar with that step, you also go out and you delete your existing schedule that you have for pulling in collections. Um, each year, uh, when things start up, uh, you have to create a new collection. That new collection is also associated to a new um, manifest, essentially new clearinghouse 
uh, for each school year. So that's uh, a required piece that if any of you haven't done, I believe that we still have about a third of the LEAs out that haven't gone out and set up their schedule yet. Um, just as a note, you can pause the schedule um, or you can also set a start date on the schedule to where you could still go out, set up your schedules, uh, even if your uh, school isn't ready to start sending data yet. Uh, but we also want to make sure that it's known too that you can still send the, the data uh, if you have data prior to your school start date. Um, it doesn't have to wait until that date. Um, the system will take all the changes and adjustments of if students did show up, didn't show up, uh, that would not be a problem. Um, and it would also give you an ability to get feedback on your data set early. So we do recommend that if that's possible uh, for uh, each of your LEA admins to uh, get that data to us as quickly as possible. Uh, once we've turned on the new school year, um, as it says here, that's August 1st is the date that we commit to having that done by. And when there is an opportunity to be able to get that out earlier, uh, we will uh, take advantage of that. And uh, I would say, honestly, typically we tend to get it a couple of days before August 1st. Uh, during that time, we're doing uh, what we call an ETL, which is an export, transfer, and load. Uh, so this is the name that USB has for this uh, process that takes that finalized data and puts it out to where it needs to be. Um, and if there are any instances where USB needs to do something from an audit to make any corrections, uh, that time frame is our opportunity to do that. Uh, and then that has to be done before uh, there's even the opportunity to um, start over on to the new school year. Uh, Utrex also has a time frame in that, that we have to work on uh, what's called rollover work. Uh, and that's essentially new school year work. Uh, so with each school year, uh, as you're all aware, we always have little things which are new, uh, new fields which are being collected uh, and showing up on the clearinghouse, or uh, just processes which have been planned ahead and are moving into becoming a different level of validation error, uh, things like that. Uh, during our rollover period, we prep and make sure that the new school year, all the rules or everything are in place for you. Uh, go to the next slide. All right, so uh, swing back to the finalizing of the Utrecht data. Uh, the school needs to make sure that the finalized data uh, has finalized correctly, that after the collecting the data, make sure that the data collected has finished processing and finalizing the data. So that's just a small little catch there of um, watch and make sure, don't just push the button and walk away. Um, check that after you've said that it's going to finalize, you click the button that didn't have any problems. Um, you can get a little error on your overview page where that finalizing is at. It'll tell you if that didn't go through. So that's kind of the thing to keep an eye for there. Um, and then also some other notes of checking the dates uh, and the time on the collection to make sure that they're all in sync and finish before the finalizing data. Uh, after the collections are started, it can take over an hour or more, depending on the size of your school or district, to uh, finish processing that. Uh, and again, just another assumption uh, to check and make sure that it finished. And of course, this is something that all LEAs are responsible for doing. So blocking that off in your calendars to be able to do so and then the mentioned before part of that, uh, you need to remove your scheduled collection afterwards. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, I will say that is something that we um, started doing internally just for cleaning up, but uh, it is a responsibility and expectation that once you are not wanting to send your collections any longer, and that can actually be earlier than the very end date where 
it's the cutoff. Uh, you could stop your collections early if you reached your finalization or totally done and happy with it uh, and didn't have any intent to uh, run again. Uh, you can also do an ad hoc if that comes up too. So just things to consider when you're doing your finalizing. Go ahead to the next screen. So deadlines for this upcoming school year. Uh, so October 7th is going to be our first finalizing period, uh, and that's due uh, on the 5th normally, uh, but with that being on a weekend, um, it's extended out to the 7th. So uh, in standard, we're set to aim for the 5th for that date, and in this instance, it's going to be the 7th, but to also try to make sure in future years, your planning includes the concept of trying to have it done by that fifth. Uh, and there won't be any extensions uh, per a lot of legislative uh, requirements and changes on uh, what USB needs to be able to pass on and how quickly we need to be able to pass on your information for you to get that funding. Uh, so that will be a change from previous years. Uh, for this October, and if there are concerns, uh, we're still uh, opening to open to hearing those and and seeing if there's any ways that we can help you with addressing them, uh, even if the the dates are not flexible. The historic updates request, uh, we have a deadline due for that, but it has to be turned in by the twenty third. So any of those that you need to have done, we can guarantee that they'll be done if you get them to us by the 23rd. Anything after that, uh, it really comes as uh, availability is there. So if we can do it, we'll try to do it, uh, but we can't guarantee it due to uh, the amount of other things which we might be dealing with during that time window. The next submission that you'll have uh, is going to be in December, uh, where that's, again, normally on the 7th, uh, and in this case, it'll be on the 9th. So uh, your historic updates for that will be due on November 25th. And then finally, we'll have the end of year, uh, which we'll have as July 7th, and the uh, historic update requests for that need to be turned in by June 23rd. And I'm not seeing if there's anything in the chat, but if uh, there is, if somebody can let me know. I think I just saw one come through. Is there going to be another unofficial uh, collection in September for all day kindergarten data like there was last year? Um, I don't believe that that's going to be a requirement. Um, I don't think that'll be needed. Um, if anything does come up, we'll try to give you as much time ahead of it as uh, possible. But at this point, there's nothing anticipated that will need that. Well, if I'll just address that real quick is okay. uh, let uh, everyone understand what happened was um, the legislation put a lot of funding into the all-day kindergarten. And as we received the... Um, the October one last year, it was the percentage was substantially shorter than what was anticipated. Um, and so that's why that request, um, that unofficial collection uh, for all day kindergarten was put out because we had to have a better understanding because the, the data quality just wasn't there. So just letting the group know why that was done. Um, and it was more for legislative uh, review to saying uh, this is the percentage of uh, schools that went to um, full day kindergarten. Thanks, Stephen. Good question. Right. Got a follow up there. Uh, uh, given the no extension corrections, et cetera, stipulation uh, with the change in October first processing timelines, can you give us a list of data elements that are most important, in other words, uh, if we were having issues, had to pick and choose what data to focus on 
in order to submit on time, which data would we prioritize? Um, Great question. Um, by the way, an email was sent out today that came from, uh, come, sorry, I'm just looking through it. But basically, it's from Scott Jones, but um, I'm trying to find who sent it out. I think it went from just our communications team out to all the LEAs. That's with a letter explaining the October 1 uh, data submission, and it doesn't go over a list of uh, what the data elements are. The primary ones to know is, thank you, uh, Stacy. Um, and, and Steve, it's the enrollment components, which are funding are the critical ones. So basically, are the students enrolled um, are the vital ones that um, the legislature are requiring us to give them. Um, we typically say we also need graduation uh, date on that time frame. Um, the demographic components, the um, the uh, uh, low income. Let's see, I'm trying to think through all the lists and, and maybe that's something that we can do for you guys is just come through, put the list together for you. Uh, Riley, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, just, this gets sent out to the business administrators, the LEA heads with the memo um, for yeah. each of the three periods. There's a list included. Okay, and, and thank you for... Thank you. Appreciate that. So there you go. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, continue. Uh, start of the next school year. Uh, so again, uh, there's going to be a little bit of repeat here just to kind of drill some of this in. Uh, but the first thing is to get your data connections going again. Um, going out to the BRF. Uh, setting up that collection schedule again uh, with the new school year with that new manifest. Uh, and at that point, you'll start to get those collections to go through based on the start date uh, that you have in there and the time that you request that to go through. Uh, each school and their SIS uh, have to have their data set up for the next school year before scheduling and starting collections. Uh, so instances of making sure you've got like all your uh, new school uh, IDs set up or anything that's new for that, any conversions to a new SIS, changing from say power school to Aspire, uh, things like that. Uh, you'll need to get those addressed uh, at the beginning uh, rather than potentially getting started on your previous SIS and then switching in uh, after a few days or a week or something like that. The clearinghouse specification gives those precise details for what is required for the accurate data. So uh, with your reviewing of the new school year, um, make sure that you're reviewing what's listed out in that clearinghouse specification for what's new, that you've made any adjustments, and that will help you to not have as many errors uh, as you'll already had everything prepped and ready with the correct responses. The new field validations uh, indicate if there will be a level one or uh, level two warning uh, error on that. So that's also going to, again, determine whether or not your data is loaded or not. So uh, pay attention to those, the warnings um, as mentioned, uh, it's good data, and it helps the students. It helps your accuracy. Uh, but for initially being able to get through with your finalizing or to get your students in place to where they can get assessments, uh, that should be one of the first places that LEAs are looking for if their student get, didn't get through for an assessment uh, when others did, uh, would be to check if they have any non-loading uh, fatal errors. Uh, each school will need to start a new daily collection schedule to be sent to Utrex. Uh, go ahead to the next screen. 
uh, at the beginning of the new school year, uh, the collections are set up uh, as soon as data and statistics uh, sends out the notification that the new school year is available. Again, we aim for August 1st or a little bit sooner if possible. The database uh, should be ready for the new fiscal year before beginning the new school year's collections. Uh, at the start of each year, there's a new manifest. Um, I've been throwing that term out, but if that's not familiar for anyone, again, the manifest is what Utrex collects. So it's essentially uh, another term for that clearinghouse specification that just gets in technically and says what it is. Um, you'll be able to see uh, there under that collection request, that's the manifest name and the version. Um, anytime that there's a change to uh, what we're collecting or how we're collecting it, uh, that version uh, changes there. And that, that's transparent for, for everyone about what those different changes are. Go to the next screen. Uh, and again, for your setting up your collections, if you're not familiar with where to do that, uh, how that happens, uh, from your data gateway, um, assuming that you have the Utrex dropdown, uh, you're probably the right person to be able to come in and do this. Uh, you'll need to be the LEA admin uh, to do that. Uh, use your other systems dropdown and the data collector, and then that will take you to the other screens, which I'm showing here, uh, which are the uh, initial homepage that you'll see, where you'll use that add uh, new scheduled collection um, down at the bottom. And then you've got another option if you've already created it and you just want to manage it on the sidebar, you've got manage uh, scheduled collection. And that's where you'll go if you need to adjust it, if you decided the time you'd picked wasn't right, uh, or if you needed to change the day that that starts on. Go to the next screen. And for that, oh, yeah, there's another question in the chat. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, we don't have the other systems drop down menu. Um, do you uh, do you have a link to be able to get to the data collector? Okay, yeah, you've got a link there labeled data collector. Sorry, I I gave my view, not your view. Uh, I'll try to get that corrected for the next time uh, this is shown. Uh, once you then get into the data collector, uh, you've checked that to go start a new collection. Uh, you've got, again, your start time, your scheduled action. Uh, do not select uh, the skip or paused collections. So there's a checkbox there. Um, uh, don't skip, uh, don't check that. Uh, we do look for just keeping these as uniform as possible as variations will tend to cause um, your school to have a problem uh, while others are not. And if there is a global problem, uh, then uh, you'll be fixed and resolved again in the same time frame as everyone else. Uh, so we do still have this as uh, something that you're going in and setting up uh, mostly for the part of the control for that start date and start time. Uh, we do have strong recommendations for that scheduled action to be the collect, validate, and submit. Um, there's another option that's commonly used that says to not send error, not send if there's an error. Um, and uh, that uh, can do exactly what that says, uh, that uh, you won't get your collection uh, to go through if you are trying to get the most of your students through uh, as possible and get the best results for that day to be able to be sent out for things like assessments. Uh, the collect, validate, and submit um, is the best choice there for that, and that will ensure that you can get the most from your collection each day and any corrections um, are taken care of the next day. Um, as this is a daily process uh, and uh, 
a self-healing process that it uses the new data each day uh, and you can correct your problems through that rather than holding off sending anything all together. So uh, for the start date, uh, we do recommend uh, when possible to start uh, at the same time as we make it available, the 8-1. Um, if your system is able to handle that, uh, then you can have as much feedback about sending your data um, as early as possible without having to wait for your school start date uh, to know if there's any things that you need to correct before that. All right, and I'll go ahead to the next screen. Then setting up your collections reoccurrence. Um, this is another area that we um, strongly recommend following this exact pattern here, which is daily, um, and that includes weekends and weekdays being checked. Uh, that is the state requirement is for it to be daily. Um, if you have concerns, um, want to discuss those, um, please reach out to us directly. Um, otherwise, that is just a requirement that needs to be adhered to. Um, the daily option uh, is preferred, again, just for our sake of being able to make sure that everybody is on the same pattern uh, and that people don't have issues because of something else. That every one day does basically the same thing um, as daily, but uh, our preference is still just to keep that set to daily. Go to the next screen. Okay, and again, if you have any problems with your collections, um, as always, reach out to the help desk. Uh, there's the link for you on that. If, if you're not familiar with the help desk um, or having a help desk account, you just need to have a Microsoft or a Google account, and then you can register in to be able to submit us problems, um, get feedback, uh, get assistance. Uh, it's not reserved to just specific people at your LEA. Go ahead to the next screen. All right, I will go ahead and hand off to Riley unless there's any questions. All righty. Um, so I'll just be going over a summary of the year end upload for school year 2024, just from the data and statistics perspective. So thank you everyone uh, for your hard work in reviewing and fixing and submitting all of your data. Uh, the courtesy data reviews were completed for every LEA prior to the June data meeting. Um, just as a reminder that we we try to share all the time, um, please make sure that you update your Utrecht's contact information when there's any personal changes. Uh, this helps us to ensure we're getting the reviews to the right people and communicating about your LEA's data with the correct people. Um, and another reminder is that getting things done early ensures that uh, there's a smoother submission process as technical problems with the SAS systems and Utrecht's uh, may and do occur. Um, and the submission deadline is around the same time every year. And so please plan accordingly with your vacations or holidays, um, ensuring that someone is available for the entirety of the submission period, as well as a little bit afterwards, just in case there's any issues. Um, so we did reviews in order of last day of school. So last year um, we did courtesy data reviews quite early, um, like in mid-May, and this was requested by LEAs at the April data conference meeting. And we found that the timing was too early because most LEAs had finished their school year when we were doing the reviews. Membership wasn't reported at 180 days yet, and some validations didn't trigger until the last day of school. And so we found that this wasn't helpful for um, really being able to look at the data. 
And so this year we uh, completed reviews in order of the last day of school for each LEA, and this seemed to work well. We ended up doing some of the reviews earlier than the last day of school for some LEAs, um, just because we needed to get them done eventually, but we had a lot fewer issues um, reviewing the data and felt that we were able to perform a higher quality review of the data. Um, just another reminder that it's important that LAs submit their year-end data on time and the earlier the better. The year-end deadline is always July 7th by 5 p.m. unless that date falls on a weekend or holiday. Uh, this year, most LEAs finalized on time, but eight LEAs did receive extensions to finalize or refinalize. Uh, the refinalizing ones came because data and, statistic, data and statistics found issues with finalized data. Um, and the extensions were given due to a third party issue with the SIF being down. Um, all LEAs ended up being finalized by July 9th, um, which was one day later than the deadline, um, which was pushed to July 8th because of July 7th being on a weekend. Um, and then USBE completed the data audits after the ETL and the year-end data for school year 2024 um, are now available for official use. And then Cliff spoke to this a little bit, but um, after the year-end data are finalized in Utrex, there's a lot of steps that USBE has to do before the new school year can happen. And just as a reminder, there's no official date for when the new school year rolls over in Utrex. Um, it takes a lot of time to do the ETL, the data audits, and IT processes. And so each year, school year may vary on what needs to get done before LEAs can roll over. So all LEAs were emailed a notification about rolling over in Utrex to this school year, school year 2025, on Monday, July 29th, and everyone can begin daily scheduled collections. Um, another reminder to not roll over in Utrex before the official email notification comes from USBE um, because submitting data before the new school year um, has been rolled over in Utrex causes major issues. And then uh, this is another reminder um, for ensuring that everyone downloads all year-end Utrex reports the day you're done finalizing. And this is a good reminder as we are quite close to actually the October submission. And so um, the archive reports are not typically available until after July. And so LEA should not depend on these archive reports. Um, the link to download the finalizer reports from the finalizer window is not where you access those reports. You access the reports by going to the year-end reports and downloading all four reports um, under that time of the school year. Um, some LEAs have also found it useful to download and save the examined data file from the submission that they finalize. And I will say I've, I've only been around for six of these finalizing periods, but um, in the time that I have been here, it has been super helpful when LEAs are able to refer to um, the last year's examined data file, um, or if they have their reports, it's really, really helpful when we're running into issues and are trying to troubleshoot things. And so it's, it's very crucial that the reports are downloaded at least, and then if possible to download the examined data file as well. And then um, this was another reminder that at year end, we turn off or LEAs are asked to turn off their daily collections. Um, once you're satisfied that your data is final, you don't continue to submit daily collections. Um, this only happens at year end for October and December, you continue um, just leaving your automatic collections running. Um, and then if you continue to submit after you finalize your year-end data and you didn't download your reports, then the, it's possible that the data in Utrex and the Utrex reports have changed because the Utrex is a dump and load system. And so that's why it's important that once you press finalize, you download your reports and then um, stop collections. And then just some findings from year end. There were a few new fields this year. Uh, there were new residential treatment centers as a field, which is optional. And this was for time, C, time code C for YIC students. And uh, there 
were no residential treatment center data submitted by any LEAs. Um, so that's just uh, FYI. If your LEA is expecting to be submitting this, then just know that this was not received um, or submitted by any LEAs. And then there were also new um, PI infraction type values, cyberbullying and hazing. And Willie and Wynn or Wynn will be talking about findings um, when they go later. And then um, one other finding that we had uh, from the year end submission was just in general around incident data. Uh, some LEAs ran into issues trying to upload all of their school year 2024 incident data all at once during the year end finalizing window. Um, and just as a reminder, there's a board rule that says that um, an LEA has to submit daily updates to the board clearinghouse using SIF objects defined in the Utrecht specs. And from the Utrecht specs, it says that all incident data submitted to Utrecht must include all required fields in both the incident I1 and incident association I2 records, and LEAs must submit updated incident data to Utrecht daily. Um, so this is just a general reminder that um, there were LEAs that ran into issues that were trying to upload their incident data all at once at the end of the school year, and that these issues can be resolved by um, submitting daily. All right, I will pass this over to David. You, um, next slide, please. Uh, so we've run the preliminary grad rate, um, and it's in current currently in production. However, we've not we need to put in a ticket still to have the grad rate preview report updated, and um, I'll be doing that soon. This just tells you how to get to to it. We've also uh, just sent out finished sending out the um, core completion status tape. Um, CSV files that we send out every year, along with the graduation uh, rate files. So those are, are now available with Remove It. Um, it I believe it's, uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember. I don't know who has access to that. So anyway, next slide. Um, this slide is just a, a reminder to check the Uzi report and make any updates for those students who are who have received a GED or graduated from adult ed. Um, next slide, please. So to make updates to your grad, um, cohort for the 2024 uh, cohort year, uh, you can do updates from now until the October 1 submission deadline, which is the 7th. Um, updates to prior year records have to be done through an S1X or historical update request. Uh, and the historical update requests are due two weeks prior to the submission deadline. Um, the, as it says, says here, the updates won't necessarily be reflected in the gradu graduation rate preview report due to the fact that it's not a live report, but you can reach out to myself uh, or anyone else on the team, then we can verify that the, that it was received. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just some useful information about what how the graduation rate is calculated, and you can see all of the different graduation and dropout rate um, codes at that link right there. Uh, next slide. Again, this is a more informational, uh, just about how it's the two different rates, the graduation dropout rates are calculated. Uh, next slide. Um, a reminder that these codes, um, the GP, GE, AE, and EX, et cetera, these will, can, uh, will turn fatal, or not fatal, excuse me, that's the wrong word, turn into dropouts um, if they're not updated. If they're correct, then obviously but make sure to check them and update them as as needed next slide these ones are ones that may turn fatal 
Um, just as a reminder to check these codes as well. Next slide. So after the October 1 submission is completed, we'll run the finalized graduation rate and we'll send out the files again and make it available for you to, to check. Um, and then the final graduation rate report will be published in December and we'll make updates to the dashboard and to the report as well. Uh, again, any any questions, you can reach out to myself. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, off to you, Willie and Wen. Thanks, David. Um, so these are just some updates and findings for the recent uh, submitted incident and discipline data. Next slide, please. Um, just to let people know, um, the 3A strategic team is currently trying to draft some detailed definitions for each infraction type to make it less confusing. Um, it'll take some time to obviously get these vetted and get LEA feedback, um, but we are in the process of trying to streamline it and make these infraction codes less confusing, um, especially when we answer your questions. As Riley alluded to earlier, um, we these, these aren't new, they were new as of last year, but just a reminder that there are some edits to the sexual harassment code, robbery, had, um, robbery or theft, and bullying, but now um, your SIS system should be having the option to input cyberbullying and hazing now. They are negatively mandated, um, and we we do need to be collecting that. So again, we, we have uh, given people the heads up, but those should be further along. So we do have some of that data collected and submitted already. So that's great to see that it is getting across. So just a reminder to continue working on those if you have not already. Next slide, please. Um, so this part will just kind of be a little update on the counts for this year. Um, so with those new infraction codes, cyberbullying, we collected about 66 counts of that and less than 10 counts of hazing. Uh, go, and then that's just to have the bullying count in comparison, we've had bullying um, for a while now. Next slide, please. Um, we're still seeing the infraction type of other being the most reported. Um, so we'll be taking a deeper look into, you know, and see where, was it warranted or was it not? And um, these are just the top five results, but we're already seeing that uh, it would be a good idea to remind administrators entering the data that uh, other may not be the best category to report. Because um, if you could go to the next slide, uh, I we took a look at the descriptions of other, and I found about 90, 900, almost a thousand counts of disruption and we have a disruption code. So if you could um, you know, let your administrators know there is a disruption code, please use that. Um, there are about 300 incidences concerning fighting. And again, we have an incident or we have an infraction code for fighting. Um, there are about a hundred instances reported for bullying and we do have an infraction code for bullying. And you can see these other uh, incident descriptions that were reported under the other infraction code, but we do have the corresponding infraction code that that should be reported under instead. So I think that would be a good thing to bring back to your LAs and your school administrators is making sure that, you know, where is this disconnect of entering in other when they should be entering it under the correct infraction code? Is it the SIS system or was it just they didn't know at the time? Um, so that's that would be something to look into. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is also just a give an update on the retaliation flag. It was new two years ago. Uh, it has gone up since, number of retaliatory incidents has gone up since its first inception. So this is just a comparison, um, particularly in regards to physical assault, it has dramatically gone up. And, and then you can see the other infractions where retaliation was related to. Excuse me, next slide, please. Uh, this is also an update on the law enforcement fields, which were also enacted in 2023. And as you can see in 2024, uh, 
the numbers have increased except for non-criminal citation. And is there one more slide for this area? I'll turn over to Maureen unless when you have anything to add. Thanks. No, that's great. Thanks. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm here to just give a brief overview about assessment rostering. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, we have four uh, sort of different ways that a student can are eligible for assessments. We have grade-based assessments, that's Utah Spire Plus and ACT. We have course-based assessments, RISE, Acadians, and Reading and Math, and Apple testing for our dual immersion students. Uh, we have the DLM for our 1% students, and we have LIDA testing for our students that um, are are indicated as English language learners. So we use a ton of student information to roster students that you provide to us. Next slide, please. So this year, our Acadians reading has moved to one vendor, ALO, Acadians Online Learning. So um, if, you if you have been using Amplify in the past, we are no longer using them as a vendor. And also, since we've moved, USBE is now rostering all students and teachers into ALO. In the past, you guys have rostered manually in ALO. That is no longer the case. Um, you guys are responsible still for adding your staff, other staff besides teachers, to ALO. Um, we have left the SFTP open so that you can bulk add your non-teaching staff to ALO. Unfortunately, the SFTP is an all or nothing proposition. So in order to leave that SFTP open for staff rostering, we had to leave open student and teacher rostering, but please do not manually roster students or teachers or classes in ALO. Um, our uploads will override your uploads. And if there's any sort of misalignment of information between any manual upload you would do and an automatic upload we would do, results could be lost. So please, you may manually roster staff. Please do not attempt any other manual rostering. Um, we should start our rostering process next week. Um, it looks like probably just like with our other course-based assessments, rostering will begin once your classes begin. So if you have classes that begin on the 12th, you will most likely see all of your students in on the 12th. If you don't start school until the 15th or the 20th, you most likely won't be seeing your students or classes until those dates, just like with RISE, just like with any of our other course-based assessments. Um, next slide. So just some quick tips on what to look for if you have students that aren't rostering into assessments. And the number one reason um, students do not roster into our assessments is that they have fatal Utrex errors. If a student record has a fatal Utrex error, that student is not going to roster for an assessment. Um, that the end. <laughs> Students with fatal uh, errors do not roster for assessments. Um, oh, I see a question. Um, if there are rostering issues, where should we go for support? That would be me. <laughs> I am. Uh, you can talk to me, and I, I assist with any assessment rostering issues. Oh, I also see the question. We sent a file for our teachers via SFTP a while ago. Will teachers we hired after the upload be added to you uh, to Utrex, or do we do them manually? Any teachers, um, any teachers hired after our initial upload of teachers can be added manually. Uh, once our load of teacher um, email addresses go into go into ALO, then they will lock those accounts down so so it will, they won't be overwritten by any further 
uploads by us, and then you'll be able to add them manually. Um, I'm sure Teresa McIntyre, who is our uh, specialist over ALO, will be giving instructions for that uh, probably in our AD meeting next week. All right, so uh, students with fatal errors do not roster for assessments, capital exclamation point. <laughs> um, it can also, there can also be a bit of delay sometimes when you have new students for them to show up on to rosters, depending on when you enter the, when your Utrecht submission goes in, when our vendors pull assessment information, there can be a little bit of a delay. Any sort of record changes, um, course changes, if you have a, if you switch from trimester one to trimester two during an assessment window, if you make records to, if you make changes to scram records, those can cause a student to drop from a roster, uh, generally just for a day. They'll drop off for a day. Once those changes go through, they're back up on a roster. And finally, for our course-based assessments, if a student students are in a course with a with a incorrect core code assigned to it that can also keep students from rostering correctly in in our assessments okay next slide finally um you leas are required to provide the opportunity for private and homeschool students to participate in state assessments so we just need minimal info you just need minimal information from these students. Um, you add them to your SIS. There's a link to the instructions at the bottom of the slide. You are not required to go out and find private or homeschool students in your boundaries to, to give these tests to. But if they do come and ask for the opportunity to test, then we have this process so that they can come and test with you. Next slide. Oh, and resources. So if you have any questions, what are the appropriate core codes for, for assessments? Our rostering manual, which has all the uh, tiebreakers, it has the business rules for each um, assessment and those private homeschool rostering instructions. Here are links to those. And if, unless there are any other questions, definitely if you have any questions about assessment rostering, go ahead and get a, head, a hold of me and I will help you out. And that's it for me. Okay, I just have a quick update um, from a member of the prevention team. If you'll just go to the next slide, please. Um, so Clarissa Stebbings works on funding um, for positive behavior plans. Each school receives a $4,000 um, fund um, in order to put those plans together. And so Cl Clarissa wants to make sure that she has an accurate list of schools that are open for this year. And so she'd like to try to get that moving um, as soon as possible. Um, if you'd go in and make sure that your, your list of schools that are, and any changes to open or closed schools Make sure that that's reflected in Cactus no later than August 15th, please. Um, currently, uh, Cactus is showing that there have been two LEAs that have closed this school year and two that have opened. And there have been nine schools that have closed and 10 that are opening. Um, so if, if your LEA has opening and closing schools, um, please go into Cactus and just double check that the information is correct. That's it. Thank you. All right. So address validation. Um, this comes up uh, for each of our meetings to make sure that we have time to keep everyone aware of what changes have happened as far as with this address validation that in the past we've talked about is becoming a requirement. Uh, go ahead to the next screen. So uh, where is it at right now? Uh, right now, uh, we still have the physical address line one uh, as an additional method 
or being able to check for that valid address. Uh, and it also will, as a note, check for right now, uh, being able to send the GPS latitude or longitude or Google Plus code. Um, that's in place not for a long-term situation, but to understand that it takes um, SISs and LEAs time to adjust and to be able to account for those new fields. Uh, those new fields are available this year, uh, and those are ready and taking data. But again, if uh, you, your LEA or SIS is not able to do that, you can still continue to use the address validation. Um, so why we're doing the address validation, uh, there's a number of reasons behind it, uh, and it could kind of spiral into a few, but I'll, I'll get us started with uh, the key thing is that uh, some LEAs need it for auditing, USBE needs it for auditing, and that we also need to uh, do this for just other needs for making sure that there is a physical address for each student that supports different programs, uh, such as the child nutrition program. Uh, when it does come to uh, satisfying, for instance, just the child nutrition program, however, uh, a mailing address um, can suffice. Uh, the key thing that our child nutrition program is desperately needing is to be able to reach out and contact parents and to contact the students to offer them the programs, make sure that's available for them. Um, it still plays a part into this, however, but uh, a lot of the rest of it comes down into uh, supporting both the state and LEAs uh, in auditing purposes, all relevant to the district of residence. So uh, these are all going to be coming back to and tied to ensuring that you've got the right district of residence set up in your system. And that's what we do with those addresses is, and what our validation is is to go out and check with the Utah GRC. Um, and we still are exploring uh, deeper options to get better validations. But for now, the Utah GRC is uh, the API that we do have access to and can work with us on those validations. So I hope that addresses the why but I welcome if you want to ask any additional questions about the why. Okay, uh, Google is not always accurate. We're using the county data to validate addresses. How do we reconcile this? Um, at this point, we don't have a perfect system. Um, Utah doesn't have a perfect system in place uh, third-party references that we have um, are, are limited in the ability to be able to address the situation. Um, and Utah GRC is limited in each in their own ways. Um, access to be able to utilize all um, isn't available to us at this time. So we are just picking what we can get access to and doing our best to work with that. Um, there is still uh, the ability to, again, with fixing these district of residence lookups, which don't work. And again, that's the key thing that we're after is that you can put in that GPS or Google Plus code instead. So it's really an alternative to, I don't have a named address that works, or my named address is too new for what's actually been surveyed. So they aren't able to actually use that new address yet. Um, and in those cases, uh, going through and using these new fields for the latitude and longitude or uh, the plus code, both of those uh, give that alternative to where we can look up and validate the district of residence for you. And then we can satisfy that need uh, for that auditing. Okay, some other questions we've got is, uh, that will be a challenge for Alpine. USPS uses the county data, so all of our automation is done this way. Um, so USPS 
would be a way that you're getting more accurate data and getting um, strong usable data. However, it might be stronger than what we can validate with the Utah GRC in some cases. So again, the requirement is still that if you do get a return response that says that it doesn't work, uh, that that may correct itself as uh, the Utah GRC is able to get further surveys out for newer locations. But otherwise, uh, it is still required that you'll have to have a valid way to give that district of residence through there. So you'll still need to be able to put in that GPS latitude, longitude, plus code, or as a workaround, if your uh, LEA SIS isn't yet capable of providing those three fields, you can still provide it in the physical address line one. Until we hear that all of the SIS systems have been able to um, set up those alternative methods, we'll keep that as a, a means to an end to make sure that for our October uh, finalization, that everyone is able to have a way to correct it um, in a way that is using the same method of the GPS or the plus code with or without your SIS giving those fields. Uh, does the GPS code auto populate? Uh, how do you put in a code? Um, so GPS doesn't auto populate. Uh, GPS is something that you would have to have actually taken at the point of location. Um, and identify what your GPS is or use an online tool that can aid in finding GPS coordinates from something such as like Google Maps. Uh, and again, the Google Maps, they're simplifying the process rather than saying you have to get the longitude and latitude. Uh, they came up with that system of the plus code, which is just a calculated uh, block. <clears throat> excuse me, for the GPS. So uh, either one are essentially equivalent to each other. Uh, it's just the GPS is a single point while the plus code, it gives you a box and it's less characters and easier to uh, be able to do. Um, if you look back on any of the previous meetings, you'll see that uh, link for the plus codes in there, uh, or you can just uh, go and search that uh, plus .code, uh, pluscodes.com, and that will take you to the Google Plus Codes. And you'll see parts in there about referencing as well, too, that this has been a utilized thing here in uh, rural Utah, uh, and it does have uh, significant support already um, for, for Utahns being able to get those addresses, use them, and also use them past the efforts of what we're doing here. So if you do um, encourage people to get those, you can also encourage them to use them for more than one thing, uh, that those uh, have also been used uh, for political uh, voting systems um, and other things like that that do require a uh, validated address. And next question of um, how do you put in the code. Uh, to put in the code, again, it's going to be based off of your, your system, your software, uh, being able to put it in with your students' information and having your SIS include that. Uh, if your SIS does not include that yet and hasn't made that available for you yet and doesn't by October um, or Technically, if they don't do it by September 1st, you're going to be feeling the impact because that's the point where these become non-loading. Uh, without having that validated, without the existing address being something that can be looked up or an alternative means, uh, this will cause those students to not load. So putting it in, if you don't have those fields, it's physical address sign one and that will bridge the gap until your LEA SIS can do so. Um, are we still needing to use the long Google Plus codes? Uh, at this time, yes. Uh, we're still needing to use the long Google Plus codes. 
and I can give an update um, if if that changes. With the short, it still does require um, the city state zip, um, but it will try to interpret and find that city. Um, I do expect that we should be able to have that in place, uh, hopefully by September 1st, if not for sure before October 1st, we'll be able to get that short plus codes in place. Uh, my team has made progress on that direction already. Um, prior to September 1st, will these show up as warnings? Correct. Yes. Um, right now they're warnings and uh, you would be best to try to consider those warnings um, as being non-loading uh, for the sake of resolution, that they're on that list that need to be resolved um, equally with your other non-loading pieces. You do have a gap though, you do have the rest of this month to be able to um, not have to resolve those without the direct impact. So you'll not be impacted with your assessments um, or at least that's our intent in providing this extra time till September 1st, is to ensure that uh, this doesn't interrupt your ability to get students assessed and get that loaded student data in for us. All right, so updates uh, have been made to the previous validation errors. Um, as I said, the short code part that is uh, still forthcoming, but some other uh, corrections have been made to that. So uh, I mentioned in the last meeting that there were about 50 that we had um, some cached validations back from those who had been using the plus codes, and it was still trying to return the cached value rather than look it up currently and have it work. Um, that's been resolved. Uh, so those should go through without a problem now. Uh, again, the three fields which we're adding in addition, uh, we're terming those as the geospatial fields. And as I said, those are available now. And we'll continue to keep the address line one available with that same ability to do the lookup. Um, as of September 1st, uh, those three uh, district of residence validation warnings up. I'm sorry, I haven't said which ones those are, but there are three District of Residence Validation warnings which will become non-loading errors. Uh, and again, the three geospatial fields will be available and maintained uh, for lookup, as well as the physical address line one. Go ahead to the next screen. So getting into which those are, out of the three. The first one here is the level one error. Uh, the other two are level two errors. Uh, this level one error that will be non-loading um, as of September 1st is uh, on the student record, the S1 record, and it's 368 uh, for its error ID. And that's again titled a district of residence error. And the details that you're gonna see on that um, as you can see in the screenshot below from the clearinghouse specification, what I'll also mention through is that uh, it must be present and it's for all LEAs, not just for charters. Uh, this same error has previously been in place as a non-loading error for charters uh, for some time. Uh, the exception uh, is that it's going to say the student is attending uh, from another, I'm sorry, an exception to this rule is that if the student is attending from another state, uh, then they're going to have a resident status of A, and those will not be included in this list. So any of your students which um, um, are not just regular Utah students, this isn't really going to be affecting them. They don't have to have an address. It doesn't have to be in the state. Um, I do believe that we clarified that before in an earlier meeting as well, um, that this is focused for Utah students. Um, any questions or concerns there before we move on to the next one? Okay, go ahead to the next screen. 
uh, for the level two errors, uh, there's two that are in place, the invalid address and invalid district of residence. The invalid address, this validation triggers when a student's address cannot be validated and therefore used to check the district of residence field. Uh, the invalid district of residence warning, uh, and by the way, these ones don't have numbers associated to them for reference, uh, but the invalid district of residence, this validation triggers when a student's address is not within the boundaries of the district of residence reported. So this error would be, for instance, if you said that they were uh, supposed to be at Alpine, but instead they were at uh, district of residence of Jordan. Um, if that address doesn't match up and doesn't align uh, with what it should be, that's what that second one's catching. Uh, the first one, again, that's catching uh, if there isn't um, an address that can be validated, or if the address, what was sent to us, can't be associated to an address to be able to validate. Any questions on those? Okay, well, that's my last slide for this. So if, if you do have anything, um, feel free to jump in now, ask questions, um, email us with any questions that you have. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody is feeling as supported as we can on these initiatives. Uh, we have had uh, separate outside of these meetings uh, meetups with LEAs and SISs to try to make sure that it's understood what our goals and needs are uh, and try to keep aligned with uh, what's reasonable and, and can be expected. Thank you. Go ahead, Riley. Um, all right. So I think um, for the most part, Cliff kind of discussed uh, what I have next, but we can go to the next slide and I'll just um, provide on the third bullet point. I think this is um, something that um, the conversation around the invalid address and the district of residence um, level two validations have been for a lot of the last year um, focused around districts, but um, just ensuring that charters are also where, you know, all three of these validations will be turning fatal. Um, however, the district of residence must be present is already fatal for charters. And so that won't affect charters. Um, but the level two invalid address, um, just as a small change in the past, this was a warning for charters. Um, by September 1st, it will become fatal for all LEAs. And in the past, charters um, cleared this warning by um, contacting Sam Uri, and this will no longer be um, a method of resolving what will be a fatal. And so the charters will need to clear this warning, um, which will become a fatal, um, by using one of the new address fields. And so um, Sam, uh, we spoke with him, and he's not going to be um, passing whatever exception that he had in the past for charters, since this is now available to all LEAs. And that is it for me. All right. Um, three items. Or, yeah, three items for me. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. I'm going to put this link also in the chat so you can grab it there. Um, or take a picture. So this year, and I just put this in the chat, this link as well, or obviously you can take a picture of this, is requirement from, um, it's HB 82, um, all employees at the LEA, um, their email address need to be submitted. Um, and this is due by September, basically 30th. So just before the October 1. I'd recommend that if you are responsible for getting this information, that you go ahead and start uh, pulling this information and uploading it so it could be off your list. Or if this is your HR, please pass this information along to the HR. Or if it's someone else, make sure you share this um, information. 
And Wynn says, only one submission per LEA, please. Yes, um, appreciate that, Win. So uh, make sure we do get this file uploaded. Uh, we'll take that, compile it, and then this will be shared with the uh, legislature and with the governor's office. So be aware that that's coming. Um, has this been emailed out to a content group already? The answer is no, it has not been emailed. You are the first group that we have shared this with. So we're giving this to you guys. Um, and we are using you as kind of our initial gatekeeper saying we're sending it to you. And if this goes to your HR, or if this goes to your BA, whoever, please take care of that process. Um, did I put in the wrong link, Riley? Just double check. Yeah, it was the like SharePoint one, but I put the Qualtrics oh, one in. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I meant to do the right one. No, anyway. Okay, go ahead. Um, just checking in and see, do we need to include substitutes? The answer, it's a great question. The answer is, if you pay the individual and you create an email for the individual, send it to us. Um, and the question is, so the QR code is wrong too? The answer is, I don't think so. Uh, that QR code should be. No, I think Aaron just posted something from his. I was, <laughs> I was trying to give some stuff to the internal staff. And anyway, I didn't get the uh, link copy correctly, so I apologize. Okay, um, next slide. So I don't have any, um, okay, Utah, I don't have anything on the next slide on it, so I'll leave it right here. So Utah fits all. Uh, there's a number of questions that are, have been coming in uh, what about, you know, if an LEA is going to uh, submit to uh, run the Utah Fits All um, program and be a supplier, do, so the first off is, does the LEA then submit that information back up to USPE? The answer is no. Um, they don't. Um, do you... Uh, other questions came in. What about the assessments? What about, you know, there, there's lots of details behind there. I'm just sharing with the group. Utah fits all. The way it was set up is, again, it's for private homeschool or students who are being taken out of the regular funding education program. And we don't, and from that point on, we, the state, will not be tracking these students. It will be between uh, the providers and the Utah Fits All um, contractor, which is, uh, their name is ACE. Um, and then the question is, will USB provide a list of students in our district who qualify for the scholarship? If not, how will we know? Uh, no, we will not be, be, be providing that list. That will be ACE. That will be providing the list. Uh, and Cliff, unless you have a different um, insight into that. Um, and you say, well, what about the fatal errors? Um, again, Paul, go ahead and ask your verbal question. What about fatal errors um, on these students? Well, again, you guys are throwing questions at me. I might not have the answer. So, Paul, if you want to ask. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, it's just a little cumbersome to do it through a chat. So are, are we to assume that these students would be enrolled um, in our student system, just like other students, except given no membership? In other words, we can't double bill the state, right? No, Is that correct. how that works? So we, you would not even submit them by Utrex to us. The reason why I'm asking that part is that um, part of Utrex is transcripts. And so that would be, I'm just wondering, how do we get that transcripting up to you guys then? When you say transcript, transcripts of what they, what a, a, a scholarship student is, is done? So, so um, we send up, I think all of us, we send up to you guys, through Utrex, all of the regular student records, but there's transcripting information that goes up. So 
um, like the the colleges around, they have an API where they can go they can go dr grab transcripts from you guys. Correct. So these students would not appear on that. Is that okay? So that's a great question. Sharing with you, the Utah transcript component is a part of the public education system. That's a great question. Um, again, my understanding and sharing with the group, my understanding is these are students who are deciding to not participate in public education, but are receiving funds from Utah to do some sort of private program. Um, so I would not expect a student who is doing the scholarship to have any transcript records. Now, they might have a partial one, meaning like they have started, uh, but at what they've started in reg regular public education. But once they've transitioned over to the scholarship, then they're no longer receiving the state, if you will, support. Um, and so I wouldn't expect to see any of the additional components put on their transcripts. So what that said is like if a student goes in, they say, I'm registering at, you know, I unenroll from Alpine, but then I re-enroll with a scholarship to do a homeschool program. That information would not go into their official public education transcripts. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I I just what that means then is that and I'm just sort of trying to I think a lot of us have questions including yourself and everybody <laughs> so I, I get it I agree I'm just trying like, to yeah. this through, get this through my head to make sure I got this right but somehow we'll have to as as LEAs we're going to have to track these kids somehow so what I'm hearing or what I'm thinking then is that we would put them in a separate school almost, not send them to you guys because it's not an official whatever. And mm -hmm. then um, we would just track it on the side through some sort of entity called Utah Fits All or whatever it might be called. Um, anyway, I, anyway, I'm just trying to put, make sure I, because at some point they may come back and say, oh, you know what, we want to go back into public school and we we applied to Alpine for, you know, for, um, you know, we had four classes from Alpine. We want to use those credits now to graduate from another district. Well, that means that we would have to transcript that somehow, I, I guess. I don't know, Aaron. And, and let's just restate is it's not a public, I mean, again, it's not a public education, um, and this is, you know, and ACE is the uh, the contractor, and a lot of these questions I probably, see Cliff, are we asking the LEAs to uh, contact ACE to answer these questions? Because again, the concept is, is they have exit, you know, this is, I'm exiting public education, but now we have a lot of public providers saying, hey, we'll provide you an education. And if someone starts to jump, well, I, I want to go back and do what I was regular doing. It's like, well, it's like a homeschool course. If someone takes a homeschool course and says, well, I want to take my homeschool courses and apply them for credit to graduate, I don't know how you do that. Um, so is, go ahead, Cliff. Worry about uh, Utah fit for all or fits for all. Um, it's not currently through legislation with the intent of storing outcomes. Um, Utah Fits for All is not able to take your outcomes. Um, if you were to say this student passed, this student failed, this student had perfect attendance, this student had an incident, um, none of that is submitted back to Utah Fits for All. All of that information is solely between the student, the parent guardian, and then the provider themselves. Uh, Utah Fit for All isn't going to be able to actually answer those questions, store it, pass it on to the state, and they're intended not to. So also when it comes to um, how you store that information, the only legislative requirement is that that 
is in place for being able to audit the invoicing and the financial aspects of it. Outside of that, the understanding is that each provider is capable of providing that class and accurately being able to track things per their intent and to be able to share information to the parent and student per that intent and agreement. Uh, they are also essentially outside of the collecting of that outcome, the same as the state is. So it's very much a parent and provider connection enabled by Utah Fit for All. Thank you. So okay, so really just maybe a recap would be that the state is not requesting or going to be recording any of this. And we have to, as a as a provider, because we've now been asked, at Alpine at least, we've been asked to be a provider, um, that we do all of the record keeping here locally, but don't pass anything to the state. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. Okay, that actually helps. And so a couple things is, yes, there's a handbook on the USB website. Um, we've been going back and forth and in, in talking about well, what happens if a student takes, the, let me say student, a family takes the money, but then re-enrolls. Um, and I know Cliff has been working with that. Um, and primarily what I think, I, I believe the, at the moment is, uh, a scholarship would then um, actually bill back against the LEA or against the parent saying, uh, you've, you know, you received a scholarship and now you're trying to re-enroll in the school within a, a, a school year. Uh, they may try to recollect that funds. Again, there's, there's some unknowns in this. This is our first year we're doing it. Just let you know, we're, we're learning together as we go through this. This is brand new, but primarily, again, the legislation or the intent of the legislation was funding for students to go outside and it's funding only. They're going outside of the regular education process uh, to do what the parents are determining are best for the, their kids. Um, there's no accountability on it. There's no tracking on it. Um, and that was intended uh, in legislation to be that way. So tough questions don't have all the answers. Um, so I just added that currently the legislation isn't covering the recovery of funds. Um, and those are areas that are still getting, as Aaron said, hammered out that uh, an instance where they get funded and then they try to go back to public school, whether or not there's any recuperation uh, that's involved or if they try to get involved with another program uh, such as SOEP when they do go back to public school, um, that's another area that's presently still in discussion as far as how that behavior will work. Um, yeah. As far as with Carson Smith, the behavior is fairly clear that it's a you're in one or the other. Um, and there isn't a you can exit UFA and go back to public school and then take part in seats. Yeah. Okay. So that's a fun one. We'll see how this year goes. Obviously, obviously, if you have questions or you run into issues, yes, send in the an email uh, to myself, to Cliff. Um We'll help route that out. Okay, let's move forward. If that's okay, uh, I don't. I mean, there is a number of questions that I and I haven't been able to look through this. Um, I'm just reading this last one. My child may return to public school at any time to stay eligible for the Utah Fits All scholarship. A, a student can't be enrolled in public school or charter school, but can take courses from a public or charter school. Uh, that is a Utah fits all provider. And thank you. All right, let's move. If that's okay, I, and I'll let my staff read through the questions and see if there's anything else that we need to answer on that one. Early warning system plans for the 2024-2025 school year moving forward. So um, if you are not aware, uh, legislation passed, this is HB 84, that all LEAs will have an early warning system. This will, 
um, to get this in place, we're in the process of writing the, the uh, new state um, RFP. Um, that writing process has just barely started. Um, we're going to take the next probably four to six months to go through that process and to uh, put that out and get uh, an award for a new contractor for the 2025-2026 school year. When that happens, when we have a new contractor, again, expectation would be January, February timeframe. It still has to, you know, we have to put it out for bid. We have to do the review behind it. Um, we have to present it to the school board uh, to make sure everything is, is cleared. And then once that happens, uh, the vendor will then be working with all SI, you know, basically with all LEAs who will be utilizing. So you have an option. You're going to either use your own choice. And if you're using your own, uh, you'll be responsible to uh, pay for it by yourself. Or if you use the state, then the state will pay half and you will pay the, the other half of it. So that's for the 2025-2026 school year in preparation move there. We are currently with um, our state contract with Panorama running that contract out through the end of this school year. Um, uh, just be aware that that's what's happening. We have Obviously, we have no idea who would be the vendor um, upcoming moving forward. We will be asking um, for the 2020, again, 25, 2026 school year, um, every LEA to identify which um, early warning system that you'll be using, either the, the state-sponsored one or um, if your own, what one that will be. So just be aware that that's coming. Uh, we're in the process of, again, just getting all those pieces uh, worked out and um, stay tuned. Any questions on early warning system? If there are, please drop it into the chat. Um, and I think the next person is Nicole. Hi, hey everyone. Um, I will be presenting just on our um, schedule for the 2025 calendar year. Um, we do send these out on our agendas every month. And if you have any questions on these, um, just the meetings are usually held on the fourth Thursday of every month. The exceptions are highlighted in yellow. So in January, we'll have that on the 23rd. It'll be a regular meeting. February, there will not be a meeting because of legislative session. March 20th, a regular meeting. And then in April, we're going to have our spring data conference um, at Nebo School District again. And we'll keep you posted on the exact day and times for that. May 22nd, a regular meeting. And this will include uh, the year end upload preview and training. June 12th, our regular meeting. And then July, again, we will not have a meeting that month. August 7th, regular September 18th, a regular meeting. And that will um, include the October upload preview and training. October 23rd will be a regular meeting. November 20th, a regular meeting. December, there will not uh, be a meeting that month. And that is it. Aaron, back to you. Do you have anything else for us? I don't. Just thank you, everyone, for the great work that you do. Uh, Riley's got her hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So the first agenda we sent out last week said June 19th for the meeting. Um, the second agenda we sent out today it's changed to June 12th because many LEAs observe Juneteenth on the 19th. The state observes it on a Monday. And so we did not have that on our radar. Um, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. And just please note that the first agenda does not have the correct date and the 12th is the correct date. Okay. 
Well, thank you everyone for uh, being here with our, with us. Have a fabulous start of the school year. Thank you for being here.